Due to the crisis in Ukraine, the United States mobilized soldiers to two NATO countries that border it, sending 2,000 troops into Poland and 1,000 troops into Romania. To be generous, this is a token force. By contrast, Russia is estimated to have 130,000 soldiers mobilized on the border of Ukraine. Even if the United States has some technical advantages over Russia, that sheer manpower would vastly overwhelm what the United States currently has in those NATO countries surrounding Ukraine. Thus, perhaps the most interesting of questions in international relations right now is why the United States chose to do this and not do any more. Well, the answer is tripwires. And it's something that the United States has experience in doing in Europe in the past. Go back to the Cold War. Think about what happened in Berlin. The U.S. also had what was effectively a token deployment there, in a city that was literally surrounded by the Soviet bloc. In the event of a Soviet invasion of West Berlin, they had one job, and that was to basically be the first casualties of a larger war. The fact of the matter is, they would have been overwhelmed numerically and flanked. But the point of the soldiers stationed there wasn't to win a battle. It was actually to deter war more generally. Had the Soviet Union invaded, American soldiers would have died, and at the level that not having some sort of response would have been politically impossible within the United States. Thus, the invasion of West Berlin could have led to a higher order escalation, perhaps even resulting in the exchange of nuclear weapons. Internalizing that, the Soviet Union would not want to invade, and the Western Bloc would get to keep West Berlin. It's basically the same story today, with a new cast of characters. If Russia invades Ukraine, and uses it as a stepping stone to push further west, those U.S. soldiers in Poland and Romania don't stand a chance, and will almost certainly be killed. For them, it's not a great outcome. But leaving them there to die is basically the point. Their deaths would cause an uproar in the United States and force policymakers to mobilize a much larger contingent of U.S. soldiers to then counterbalance Russia properly. Because Russia is aware that this is going to happen in the event of a war further west, Russia internalizes the threat and simply chooses not to invade those areas. Whether they invade Ukraine or not is still up in the air. It turns out that we can use the tools of modern crisis bargaining theory to have a better understanding about why this works. And it's a subject I know a lot about because it's what I study professionally. Let's think about this a little bit more in the abstract. Imagine that there was a full-scale war between the West and the East, NATO and Russia. Think about what the expected outcome of that war might look like. Maybe the ultimate border that would be drawn between the two looks something like this. So that, in expectation, NATO and the West would receive everything to the left of that line, and everything to the right of that line would belong to Russia and the East. It's possible, of course, that NATO might get a little bit more, or even a lot more than that line. And likewise, Russia might get a little bit more, or a lot more. The point of the line is to represent the expected outcome, weighing all of those probabilities together and averaging them out. That said, war is not free. People will die, buildings will be destroyed, and some of the land might become entirely worthless. We can visually represent Russia's cost for war by drawing this red line here. The value of the territory that is between the white line and the red line represents how much in costs Russia would expect to pay by fighting a war. It is a little weird to think about soldiers' and civilians' deaths in terms of square miles of territory, 
but it is something that policymakers think about. So it's not ridiculous to be implementing it here. We can do the same thing for NATO, this time drawing the line to the left of the white expected value for war. Everything between the blue and the white line are the costs that NATO expects to pay in the event of a conflict. What's interesting here is that everything between the blue and the red line is a settlement that is mutually preferable to a war. One of the most important findings in international relations is that there should always be that kind of space between those two lines, and thus there should always be settlements that are mutually preferable to war, and thus war itself is a bit of a puzzle. Rather than thinking about pipe dreams of their best possible outcomes, each of these actors should instead be focusing on how to draw the border between those two lines. For example, it wouldn't make sense for Russia to make a proposal further to the left of the blue line, like this one, as its final offer. That's because the West would see the blue line as what they would expect to get by fighting, and that's more than what they would be getting by the proposal that Russia has just placed on the table. As such, they'll fight a war. Thus, perhaps counterintuitively, making this proposal is a bad idea for Russia. It induces NATO to fight, and if NATO fights, then Russia in expectation, after factoring in those costs for war, gets everything to the right of the red line. Similarly, it wouldn't make sense for NATO to propose this line as its final offer. That's because if Russia were to fight, it would receive everything to the right of the red line, which is more than the proposal that's on the table. And again, perhaps counterintuitively, that's actually bad for NATO. If Russia is induced to fight, then NATO's expected value for war is everything to the left of the blue line. And that's not very good. As a result, what they really should be spending their time negotiating over are the set of divisions that are between the blue line and the red line. The problem here is that there are a lot of them, and the distributional consequences are important. What one likes within that range of settlements is something that the other one doesn't like. For instance, NATO would really like to draw a border that looks like this and have it be the ultimate division. That's because it is giving Russia almost what Russia expects to receive by fighting a war, and thus leaves the vast majority of the surplus created by instituting a peaceful settlement to NATO. Russia, of course, doesn't really like that. It would instead like to have a settlement that looks closer to something like this, which is putting that border very close to the blue line, and thereby giving a small sliver of surplus to NATO, and allowing Russia to capture a lot of the benefits of peace. Consequently, the sides have diametrically opposed preferences on the set of settlements that appear between those two lines. As a result, a lot of the geopolitical jockeying that you observe is geared toward figuring out ways to capture more of that surplus and deny that surplus to the other side. That's where those recent troop mobilizations come into play. Imagine that Russia got aggressive and used its military forces to redraw the border like this, attempting to alter the status quo favorably in Russia's direction. Well, to do that, they're going to have to overrun those U.S. soldiers. It's basically impossible to do that otherwise. But those U.S. casualties will trigger a broader conflict, and therefore Russia will not actually receive everything to the right of the black line. Instead, after factoring in the costs of war, Russia will only get everything to the right of the red line. In turn, those token forces in Poland and Romania might just force Russia to accept a status quo that is relatively favorable to NATO, given that they don't have better alternatives to change it. That's the theory anyway. 
We'll see how it plays out in action. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Take care.